wonderful hymn which is called Wonderful Merciful Savior. Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for the privilege and the honor that we have to worship together and meet with you on this day. We invite your presence to be here through the Holy Spirit to guide and direct in the activities of this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. How are we doing this morning? Yeah. <laughs> good. Super great. Could be worse. Those are good things. I'm, that's, hey, it's been cold. It's been wet. It's been a whole lot of things this week. And allegedly, it's supposed to get colder. And I'm just believing that Summer's going to come a little later this year than it did last. Can you hear me better? You got a microphone. I'm going to need you to possibly read for me, Brenda. And Ron always reads. He's good with that. But God is good. It's very pretty today. It was pretty yesterday, too. I can say that um, outside of running some errands with my aunt, I did no work yesterday, which was very shocking for me on a Friday. 
And I didn't even feel bad about it. So God is good on that. Wonderful song this morning from Elder Tui and Brenda. It was right on point to what our Sabbath moment is about this morning. This is the last Sabbath for January. And I want us to go, I want us to talk about this idea of obedience and why it's important for us to be obedient. Um, I think that sometimes we lose sight of why the importance of obedience. Sometimes we just do things just because we do it. It's almost like I remember my mother would force me to apologize to my sister when I did something wrong. And I apologized because she told me to apologize. I didn't see the value of saying I'm sorry. I didn't think I was sorry. And my sister and I fought all the time, so that one apology didn't change from us possibly fighting in five minutes. But I was obedient because my mother asked me to do it. I think sometimes we're obedient, but I don't know if we always see the value of that obedience with God. And there is always value in doing what God has told us to do. And not only for safety reasons, but I think it even helps to just our everyday living. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible says a lot about obedience. We, talk, we see that concept in the Ten Commandments. And Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28 sums it up as obey and you will be blessed, disobey and you will be cursed. The general concept of obedience relates to us hearkening or hearing or responding to a higher authority. One of the Greek terms for obedience conveys the idea of positioning oneself under someone by submitting to their authority and command. Another Greek word for obey in the New Testament means to trust. I want us to talk about, I think I have like maybe seven, Reasons why obedience to God is important. I'm going to ask people to read from just giving you the scripture versus giving out my normal little cards. Um, because everyone in here I know is quick with their Bible and knows where to find these verses. The first verse, if you can read this one for me, Ron, it's John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Thank you. Jesus calls us to obedience. In Jesus Christ, we find the perfect model of obedience. As his disciples, we follow his example as well as his commands. So the first reason is God asks us to follow his commandments and that if we love him, that's a show of it. An example, I say a modern day example is in our friendships and relationships and someone asking us not to do something and the love for them by obeying and being obedient to that. So that's our number one. If you can, for me, Elder Tui, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Is that Romans 12, 1? Yes, that is. And I have another version. It's the New Living Translation, and it reads, Oh, so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Obedience is an act of worship. When the Bible places strong emphasis on obedience, it's critical to remember that believers, that salvation is a free gift of God and we can do nothing to merit it. True Christian obedience flows from a heart of gratitude for the grace we've received from the Lord and in our behavior. So we have to know that it's an act of worship for us to be obedient. The third one, I will read this particular we will read, it's Luke eleven twenty eight, And I will also read Exodus 19, 5. So I'll go with Exodus 19, 5 first and then Luke eleven twenty eight. And Exodus 19, 5 reads, and this is in the New Living Translation. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to you. 
In Luke 11, 28, Jesus replied, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Over and over again, the third one is God rewards obedience. Over and over again, we read in the Bible that God blesses and rewards obedience. We know that God um, desires obedience and that there are rewards in that. Now, I also want to know that we don't want to get confused that in God rewarding obedience, that means that we have this perfect life as Christians. Because I believe sometimes people presume that if I'm walking in the walk with God as I should, that I won't catch cancer or I won't get sickness or illness, or I will not go through these troubles and storms in our life. And I don't want us to get confused that the reward of obedience does not mean that God keeps us from any type of um, hardships in our life as Christians and believers. Number four is obedience to God proves our love. I have here, by this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, First John 5. Two through three, the book of John, the book of First John and Second John clearly explain that obedience to God demonstrates love for God. We have. Can I get? Do you have? Do you have a? Can I get you to read for me, Miss Lois? It's First John. Oh, thank you. It's First John two. Give me one second. Let me get my. I want to make sure I send you to the first to the to the right place. First John two, three through six. Two verses three through six. Thank you. First John verses 3 through 6 mm -hmm. it reads and he is the proprietor for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the world whole world and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments he that says I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Thank you. Obedience to God demonstrates our faith. When we obey God, we show our trust and faith in him. The same version of that text in the New Living Translation says, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how, he, that is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And being obedient, we are, we are demonstrating our trust and faith in God. Um, a typical example, of course, for our church in particular are people that take um, Sabbath stands. It is difficult in many professions to say that you don't work on Saturday. And that is trusting in God that he will provide. And it's I always say that it is easy for those of us that don't have to work on Sabbath to say that we can come to church. It is very difficult when you have a family and kids to say that I'm going to obey God. And that's a, that's a hard um, trust in the God and faith that he will take care of your family even if you lose your job. So obedience does demonstrate our faith. The, so I have here, disobedience leads to sin and death. Um, Romans 5, 19 says, For as by the one man's, Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's, Christ's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The disobedience of Adam brought sin and death into the world. This is the basis of the term original sin. But Christ's perfect obedience restores fellowship with God for everyone who believes in him. So our disobedience does lead to sin and death. We know that. And if we don't, we need to be very clear on that. That just as there are benefits for obedience, there are also the same like benefits, I guess, of disobedience. The difference is the opposing things. We have life and our obedience to God, but there is sin and death in the disobedience. 
And the last one that I want to go over, Rosemary, can you read Psalms 119, 1 through 8 for me? 1 through 8. Okay, Psalms 19, 1 through no, 8. No, 119. Psalms 119, yes. 119, 1 through 8. Yes. Says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. Is it one through eight? One through eight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The last one is through obedience we experience the blessings of holy living. Only Jesus Christ was perfect, therefore only he could walk in sinless, perfect obedience. But as we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us from within, we grow in holiness. This is known as the process of sanctification, which can also be described as spiritual growth. The more we read God's word, spend time with Jesus, and allow the Holy Spirit to change us from within, the more we grow in obedience and holiness as Christians. Um, I had a quick little story about the blessings of holy living and obedience. There is the director of a local um, bar association for attorneys. It's our local group. She was telling me about a book she was reading. I know someone will know the book, but it talks about these eight people with certain diets and them living beyond 80. I, don't, I can't remember if she says it's the blue. blue I, yes, the blue zone. And she, is, she was raised as a Catholic, so, but she knows I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I was in her office one day, and she was talking about I was reading the blue zone, and they were talking about the only place in America was this place, Loma Linda, California, and Seventh-day Adventist. She said, and they were talking about this wonderful health message they have and how healthy they are. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking that those are some of the blessings of being faithful and doing what God has asked us to do. That um, there are many Adventists I know of that have had troubles with cancer, but how the body responds differently because of just even the health message. And this idea that, and if we think about it, if we're obedient to God, there are blessings in our everyday living. If we are not dealing with, if I am, if I'm faithful and trusting of God, my behavior is that way, my interaction with people are that way. Think about the blessings we have in being obedient and just as simple as the food ministry. That we're providing people with the simplicity of having food. And that it's more of a blessing to us than even to them because we get to help people in their simplest of needs. I think about that with this shutdown we had that is now no longer a shutdown, but we'll see in a couple weeks, that in people doing God's work, that they get to serve in the blessing that we get. So I want us to think in, in our obedience, we want to remember, I'm gonna run through the seven if my iPad doesn't, no, your, the technology for you, it's, it's, um, it's holding up. We have to remember that God calls us to obedience. It's an act of worship for us to be obedient. We're rewarded in obedience, that it proves our love to God, that disobedience leads to sin and death, and that we experience blessings and holy living by being obedient to God. I want us to remember that this last Sabbath of the first day of the year and take this throughout the rest of the year. May we go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious, kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath moment to talk about obedience. Lord, be with us as we go about our days and do your work. That, Lord, we're not just obedient in our language, our interaction, our behavior, but, Lord, we're also obedient in our money, our time, and in what we give, not only to the church, but those around us. Lord, let our obedience flow and that the community will see that those people love the Lord in our interaction and the work that we do. Lord, be with us for the remainder of this Sabbath day. Be with us in our Sabbath school classes and in the divine worship service. Lord, we just thank and we praise you for a beautiful Sabbath day and allowing us to still yet again be able to congregate here on this blessed day. All these things in your name, amen. We have two adult Sabbath school classes. We have one in the sanctuary. Elder Boyd will teach that. We also have the Revelation class with Pastor Thompson in the Mayus room. If you have little ones, if you take them to the left, that's primary, and if you take them to the right, that's cradle roll.
that's how I have to solve it. Folks, what we will do, um, we will have prayer, and then we will open up the scriptures and uh, pick up our, our South School lesson from where we left off. Um, does, does anyone need a, uh, a quarterly? If you have your Bible, you're, you're in good company, so we'll, we'll be good. Um, uh, let's, let's bow our heads. Merciful Lord, thank you just for our time together this morning. We pray that your spirit would come and, Lord, fulfill the promise of your word that he, Lord God, would teach us and bring all things to our remembrance, whatsoever things that you've said. Do this for us now as we open your word. Empower us to be teachable. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I shared with you all a couple of weeks back something that I, I really want to uh, encourage, and that is most of the challenges with, open, with, with understanding and the study of the book of Revelation revolves heavily around our not being familiar with how the book is organized. And you all know how I, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest of fans with, uh, um, what do you call them, Sister Faye? With cliff notes type stuff with the Bible. You know, I'm, I'm just, that ain't my, Sister Lois, I like line upon line, precept upon precept. But there's a page in that little study guide that I would encourage if you don't have a copy, get someone with a copy to Xerox it. Now, I want to say it's page 26, but it's what breaks down how the book of Revelation is organized in those seven divisions. If you can wrap your mind around that organizational structure, it really helps with the study of the book. So, Revelation chapter 5, verse number 5. A powerful text. Would someone with the microphone, preferably, read to us Revelation from Revelation chapter five, verse number five, which is our and, memory text. And one of the elders said unto me, "Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book." and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, isn't that just like Jesus? Does not Jesus do that act all the time? Do you see it in the passage? What's in that passage? He crying. He bawling his eyes out. And who does the Bible character say can stop you from crying? The lion. He said, don't cry. Jesus has this. That's the object lesson of Revelation. This is why all 22 chapters revolve around best, one of the best examples of all 22 chapters being the Revelation of Jesus. He's the one when things look like they're down and out. Don't cry. The line of the tribe of Judah. He has this, all right? Now, today's lesson heavily revolves around Revelations chapter 4 and 5. And if I were to be a little forward, I would say it's probably the two chapters out of the book that we spend the least time reading. 
And I would go a little further to say, it's the two chapters out of the book, we should read more. Or one might even want to say, it's the two chapters out of the 22 that we should read the most. Because they paint the picture of the reality of life. All right? So we know John was told to write what he saw and he heard. And we know that he finishes up the dictation session to the seven churches. In Sunday's lesson, somebody give us the first three verses of chapter 4 of Revelation. As the heavenly throne is described. Hold one second, sis, we won't get you on the internet. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. All right, so let's get the setting. Door opens up, right? Where is the door opening up to? Heaven, so he sees this door open to heaven. And the voice, what does the voice beckon him to do? Come on up. Come on up. And then what does he say? What's he going to do for him? I'm going to show you some things. Now, what was John told to do about the stuff he saw? Write it down so John knows, okay, let me get my pen ready. About to write some stuff down. Next verse, please. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So let's ask the simple question that's very profound. Where does he see this throne? In heaven. And what's, what else does he see? Now we know ain't but one going to sit on the throne in heaven. Down here it gets a little confusing. But up in heaven, there's not but one sitting on the throne. And so who is that? God. God, God sitting on the throne. Oh, you went ahead, mate. See, Sister Faye done hook you all and us up. This is the chart I was talking about. Out of all the things that's in that book, you pass them around. All the things that's in that little study book, this page is the one I would encourage you to cut it out because it helps you see how the book of Revelation is organized. And it is superly cool in understanding what John writes down. All right. So, thrown up in heaven, one sitting on the throne. Then what else do we see, sis? Or what did John see? And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, he says when he looked at the throne, the one sitting on the throne, what did he look like? Beautiful stone. So, so, but, but Jasper and, 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 and what was the other uh, precious stone? Sardin. What, 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 what was that like? Different color. All right. And then there's this bow. Emerald is green. All right. So now we see this green bow. Okay, okay, okay. Continue, please. What else does he see? And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. Uh-oh. And upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting, uh -oh. clothed in white raiment. Now let's think for a minute. Let's just focus on what he saw. So he sees this one throne, and the one sitting on it is just, whew. then he sees this bow. And what color is it? Green, it's emerald. And then he sees how many other seats? 24, and the folks sitting on those seats, how were they dressed? And, and what did they have on their head? Crowns, okay, we just described him, what he saw. Next verse, please. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Wait a minute now. So he looks at the throne. We know it was like, what was that? Sapphire. And we know it was like, what does that say? Jasper. But what's coming up out of the throne? Now, we don't quite grasp that until I 
put you in a severe thunderstorm. When lightning happens, what's our natural inclination? Most of us. What do we do when the lightning goes, what do we do? So, so there are a few of us that go out and want to see. That's what I do. I just, I, lightning fascinates me. My wife on the other end, when she's shutting shades, and I ask, what you shutting the shades for? They ain't going to stop nothing. I mean, if it's going to hit you, it's going to hit you. And then she wants to get in the closet and shut the door. Like, what you doing that for? If it's going to hit, I mean, lightning goes, it's going to hit you, right? But, but most of us, when we see lightning, but John says he sees lightning coming out. And so what do we know about the brightness of the throne? It's pretty intense. All right, so, so, so when I get, uh, I get the throne and I see this brightness, now I'm starting to get an understanding of what and why Moses in his little bitty time hanging out with God, when he comes down off the mount, what do the people tell him? Man, come here, we can't deal with that brightness. Man, you hurt my eyes. Put a veil on. All right? So this is what John's seeing. Next verse, please. And out of the, th um, sorry, six. Please. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Now, verse 5 ended saying that before that throne were the seven what? Seven what? Seven candlesticks, and then, but what else was there? Seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God. Everybody, everybody track it. Now, if the seven spirits of God, let's go back two weeks. If the seven spirits of God are there, who do we know must be somewhere near? Holy Spirit. But who else do we know? If the seven spirits of God are there, who do we know must be near? How do we know Jesus must be near? This is just really quick. Turn back to Revelation chapter number 3 and read verse 1. Anyone? And unto the angels of the church in Sardis write, These things said he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. So who has the seven spirits of God? Jesus. And so when John sees the seven spirits of God around the throne, who do we know has got to be somewhere around? Jesus, so he's there. Keep that in the back of your mind, because this is the revelation of Jesus. Right? He always, he always around somewhere. All right? All right. One more verse. Verse number seven. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast has had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And I messed up. You've got to read verse 8 because that tells us more about these beasts. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now don't let that five-letter word Excuse me, that six-letter word mess you up. Don't let the fact that these beings are referenced as beasts. They're just beings, okay? And what do we know about them? They worship him. All right, so, so see, this is Lois. Whoever they are, they worshiping God. And what's coming out of their mouths? Now, now, the fact that they're saying holy, 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 my mind goes to Isaiah 6. Because Isaiah was given a chance to look up in heaven, and what did he see flying around? Anybody remember? Can we go there really fast? Because we're kind of combining Sunday and Monday. Just, just really quick. Isaiah chapter 6. We've got to find out who are these beasts. Isaiah chapter 6. And 
Somebody start with verse 1. This is Isaiah. Now, this is halfway the other side of the Bible. Isaiah 6, verse 1. What does Isaiah say? Anyone with a microphone? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah, unlike John, John said he saw one sitting on the throne. Isaiah tells us who he saw on the throne. Who was it? Who does Isaiah see the on the Lord. throne? The Lord. The Lord. All right, so next verse, please, Elder Tewitt. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. Uh, with twain he could uh, cover his um, feet, and with twain did he fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Wait a minute. So Isaiah says, I saw the throne of God. John says, I saw a throne. Isaiah says, I saw some seraphims that had six wings. Two of them, they covered their face. Two of them, they covered their feet. And two, they just flew around. John says, I saw some beasts. They had six wings. And Isaiah says, these beasts, when they're flying around the Lord, what are they saying? Well, now I just know who's sitting on the throne in, in Revelation 4. Because these folks saying, holy, holy, holy. Now, we could go to Ezekiel 1 and find these same beasts. Now, now here's my question. Here's my question. Here's my question. These seraphims, these angels, what are their primary purpose? To worship. They got worship. Everybody got it? I say... That's their minor job. And when I say minor, I don't mean less job. I mean it's just in the list. They worship God because that's who they are. But they got, a, as the little boy says, a specific job that they're supposed to do. Y'all want to read about it? Go to Hebrews chapter 1. See, they're, when they fly around the Lord, they're saying, holy, 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 because he is deserving. But God has specifically dispatched them to a particular job. And we find it in Hebrews chapter 1. In the interest of time, let's get to the goody. Somebody read for us verses 5, excuse me, verse 5 through 7 of Hebrews 1. Anybody? For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, the writer here is comparing Jesus to everything else. So the answer to that question is, he said that to none of the angels. Jesus is special. Next verse, please. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten unto the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. That is their job. One of their primary jobs is to worship God. But notice what the next verse says about them. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angel spirit and his minister a flame of fire? So here we find the angels referenced as ministers. Mm -hmm. So when I hear people say minister, more often than not in the Bible, it's the verb tense of the word, mm -hmm. not the noun. Mm -hmm. And so when I read minister in the Bible, I want to know to whom have they been commissioned to minister? Is that a fair question? Well, I kept reading in Hebrews 1, and I got down to verses 13 and 14. Mrs. Lewis, would you just sum us up? 14, 13, 14? 13, 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. I can answer that. He ain't said that to any of them. That place is reserved for Jesus. But notice, even though the Bible's primary purpose here is to talk about Jesus, the Bible is so rich, it gives us some insight into the, who the angels are. Notice the next verse. Are they not all ministering spirits? Talk about the angels. 
sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So what is the angels, one of their primary purposes? Oh, see, y'all don't even want to say it. To take care of our knuckleheads. To minister to those who are heirs of salvation. That's what they're here for. We love talking about the devil and his demons, don't we? Oh, the devil got demons everywhere. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Anybody finish third grade math in here? Okay. So you remember when you learned about fractions in third grade math, you had a pie? So let's imagine a pie, and let's cut the pie into equal thirds. Everybody follow it? Now, if I take away one-third of the pie, how many thirds are left? Y'all sure about this? Well, the Bible says up in heaven, the devil only fooled one-third of the angels. So when I reference his demons, I'm only talking about one-third. How many thirds are left up there to minister to my knucklehead? Well, we ought to be talking about them. Jacob tried to go to sleep one night. Went into a deep sleep and he had a dream. And he saw this ladder tying earth to heaven. And he saw angels going up and down. And I remember when I read that, why are they going up and down? Well, Hebrews tells us they're coming down here. They're up there praising God, holy, holy, holy. Then when they come down here, block it, stop it. Oh, no, demons, you can't have him. And then when Jesus sees Nathaniel, what did he tell Nathaniel? He said, Nathaniel, I saw you before you before I even met you. He says, I am the ladder. So Jesus is what's tying heaven to earth, and the angels are descending and ascending to minister to our knuckleheads. Man, that's some good stuff. Well, that's what John's writing down. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as we read the word, it tells us that um, the throne room, the place of worship, and I'm trying to imagine So I get real confused. So, so, so you're, getting in, you, you're getting into Monday's lesson. So let me show you why I get confused. Let's go to Monday's lesson. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you, you're asking some questions, Sister Lois said. I get real confused, all right? All right. In Revelation 4, all right, can, can we jump to 5 real fast, get something in, and then come back to Sister Lois's point? All right. Jump to chapter 5. And somebody read for us verse number 11. Just talking about this, this, what John saw up in heaven. 5.11, preferably with a microphone. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Wait, wait, wait. So, 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 so let's see your point. We know the angels round the throne and what they're saying. Y'all work with me. What are they saying around the throne? This is not a trick question. What are they saying around the throne? Holy, holy, holy. So John says, I looked at the throne, and I started paying attention to the angels, and he started trying to take count. What's he saying in the rest of that verse? And the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. How big does that have to be? Now, I have been to some big pavilions before. Anybody ever been to some of the largest pavilions or football stadiums? Y'all ever been to a pro football game? Anybody in here? I mean, college football. You got some college football stadiums hold 120,000 people. I remember the first time I went to something like that, there was more people in that stadium in all my hometown, my little town. You know, I was like, wow, man. But that's 120,000 people. So if you do the basic math, 10,000, well, that's over 100 times 10,000. What's 10,000 times 10,000? Yeah, that's over. I ain't never seen no pavilion hold a million people. Y'all seen any like that? Just one, I mean, especially a throne room. So, so it, it is a room. But that ain't when it stops. And then it says it's thousands of thousands. Now, of means multiplication, right? So how big is this place? No, no. How big is the rainbow? Because remember, the green rainbow covers the whole facility, right? Now, if these angels saying, holy, holy, how loud must the place be? Now, if I say something, y'all promise not to throw me out? Because if I say this, y'all promise not to throw me out? Okay, 
Hey, hey, hey. so it's Willie saying, I ain't going to ain't gonna promise that now. <laughs> let, me, let me ask y'all, let me ask you something. When Isaiah said he saw the temple of God, and they were saying, holy, 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 what was happening to the doorpost? Well, why do we think we got to be quiet down here? Yeah, I'm about to go here. See, there's a certain genre of worship music. We say, oh, that's the devil. Why? It's too loud. Well, you might want to check your Bible. Something's shaking them doorposts up there. And it's not them whispering. Holy, holy, holy. No, no, no. The Bible says the door frame rocking up there. I don't know. I'm just reading the Bible where it's written. You got to get more biblical and less whatever. Yes, ma'am. That was my next question. <laughs> Now, y'all, this is Lois. She's she taking us here. Just keep in mind. If we are supposed to be ministering and we are supposed to be servants of God, what's wrong with us? You know, why are we so quiet and we not worshiping him as the Bible has told us to? Now, it's fascinating in you asking that. And I'll have to answer that the way the counterfeiter answers how does he determine what the counterfeit bill is. So if you study that division of the government, they don't spend a lot of time studying counterfeit bills. They spend a lot of time studying the real one. And so in answering your question, I don't know why, but I don't know why we not, how can I say it properly? I can't say what we doing, but I can tell you what we not doing. And we not following what's here. And when you don't follow what's here, it leads you down the interesting paths. All in the name of what's right. Okay? Can we look at a few more details? All right. Jump back to chapter 4 and notice verses 9 through 11, this heavenly throne room. Anyone? Revelation 4, 9 through 11. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, uh -huh. who liveth forever and ever. What about them, them elders that's sitting in them chairs? What do they do? Verse number 10. Wait, verse 20. And four elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying... What are they saying? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, Sister so Lord, since this is our conversation, because other folk might not want this conversation. When I, the Lord brought me back to himself, I came back with a vengeance. If the Bible didn't say it, I ain't really want to hear it. Actually, I'm not much different now. All right? I've mellowed out a little bit. But you get me on the wrong day, you come talking crazy, I'm going to say the Bible don't say that, and you just have problems. I mean, it's just the way it happens. And when I came back, though, I heard some of that same rhetoric I heard before I had left. Can I tell you what the rhetoric was? You know, you need to be out witnessing, because if you don't witness, you're not going to have, any, you're not gonna have any, any stones, any gems, any diamonds in your crown. Y'all ever heard that? Oh, we got a witness because we got to have diamonds in our crown. You know. And I, I used to, when I came back, you know, I was half cop. I'm coming back, Sister Barbara. I just, I used to say, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And then I was reading Revelation chapter 3, and the last part of verse number 10, and I went, oh. Now, sis, what's your name? Sister Tamika. You just read something to us that we didn't even read. What's the thing you told us in the last part of verse 10 of Revelation chapter number th 4? What did you read? Read, read verse 10 again to us because we didn't hear what you said. The four and twenty elders fall down before him and that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. Pause. So we know that the angels worshiping him. And them four and twenty elders worshiping, because we know the four and twenty elders, what kind of clothes they got on? White robes, and what's on their head? Oh, so four 
and 20 elders, when you get in the presence of Jesus, what you going to do with your crown? Rest of that verse. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And then what, does we, what do the four and twenty elders do? They take off them crowns. Nobody care about no crown. And they slide it to Jesus' feet and say, you the man. I hear people, when I get to heaven, I'm going to wear my crown. Now, what you going to get to heaven, you see Jesus, you're going to take it off, slide it at his feet and go, you the man. He is the essence of heaven. It starts and it ends with him. I hear people, oh, when I get there, I'm going to have my, man, forget a mansion. Nobody care about no house. Whatever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. Amen. You ain't even got to build me nothing. I, I can have me a little tarp. Just let me go where Jesus goes. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I like this thing about the, the 20 elders, 24 elders, because these are human beings. Wait, 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 wait. See, see, so, so we got to prove that. And, and uh, we know that when Christ was resurrected, there were others that were resurrected with him mm -hmm. that he took to heaven as the first fruits. So these four and 20 elders evidently were ones that were redeemed and taken to heaven. And they sat on thrones around God's throne. It's so, amazing that God would elevate human beings to his throne. So, so now Elder Tui is taking us down a path. He's, he's really taking us into a couple of days. But we got to prove what he just said. He said that the four and 20 elders were human just like us. All right. Would y'all like to see what the scriptures say about that? All right. Jump to chapter 5 and notice what John says in verses 8 and 9. He's still talking about those beasts that fell down and worshiped Jesus and those 4 and 20 elders that fell down and worshiped Jesus. So somebody read for us verses 8 and 9, preferably with a microphone, and, and verse 10 of Revelation 5. Anybody? Revelation 5, verse 8, 9, and 10. Oh, oh, Sister Faye, want a mic? Here's, we got three right here from you. Read it for us, Sister Faye. Chapter 5, verse, verse 8, 9, and 10. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, verse 9 says what those four and twenty elders are saying. What do they say? And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. Wait, 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 wait. So that means the four and twenty elders had to be redeemed back to God, mm -hmm. and they were redeemed back to God through the blood of the Lamb. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a sinner. Mm -hmm. So now I got evidence that there are sinners in heaven, and they get there by being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So that's how they got there. Guess how we going to get there? Sure ain't going to get there by doing right. We're going to get there by submitting. All right? Oh, but I cut you off. It gets better. And hast redeemed us to God by, the blood, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Hold on, Sister Faye. Hold on, Sister Faye. Because we haven't gotten there yet. But in a few weeks, we're going to hear about this third, we're going to hear about this first angel that has the everlasting gospel. And he's going to be preaching. Does anybody remember to whom that first angel preaches? Now, y'all going to have us turn to Revelation 14 and, and read that. Every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. So these 24 elders, they're folk that came to, oh, so they sent us that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Now, Sister Faith, this is why, remember I said when we started, when we read the book of Revelation, the two chapters that we don't spend enough time in is four and five. We want to jump to six and talk about the seals and then we want to jump over to eight and talk about the trumpets. 
And then we want to jump over to 12 and 13 and 14 and talk about the mark of the beast. And then we want to jump to 17 and 18 and 19 and, and get into the last plagues. And then we want to go down and, man, please. Those are bit after. The book is about the master. Because what is he going to do with them folk? He can come out of the earth. Sister Faye, what, what does that next verse say he's going to do to us? And what he did for the elders? And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Man, if you want to be the big boss, just submit. That's a Bible verse that says that, right? Humble yourself before the Lord, and what will he do? He, look, look, Pastor Elder Chap, that's what the text says. He'll raise us up. So, Sister Lois, all of this is happening. Now, these folk are happy, and we're in Tuesday's lesson. I'm curious what they're happy about. Somebody read for us the first four verses of Revelation 5. Why are these people so happy? Anybody? Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Pause. Who's sitting on the throne? Jesus. Who's sitting on the throne? God. All right. Remember now, because Father's sitting there with, and, and he's sitting on the throne, right? Because what's coming out of the throne? With Lightning. Writing. All right. Lightning coming up out of the throne. And what's sitting on around the throne? A rainbow. And what color is it? Green. And who's flying around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy? The seraphims, but we know that ain't only that that's not the angel's only job. We know that who are they really to minister to? What did Hebrews tell us? Who are the angels ministering spirits to? Our knuckleheads, those who are going to be saved and that are saved. And, and so while all this is going on, John says he looks at the throne, one sitting on the throne, he got a scroll. Continue, please, sister. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. A, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Uh -huh. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Let's pause right there. Now, we, we are tough with the book thing, but let me give you just a little bit. Book in John's day. You put a seal. There were seven on here. Don't get caught up in the count, but get caught up in the number and its meaning, right? Yeah. Now, let me ask you something. Um, Brother Mike, big, strong guy, right? If there was a piece of furniture on that pulpit and it needed moving, and Brother Mike walks around and says, anybody in here can pick this up? can we infer about Brother Mike? Yes. Now, if Brother Mike's the strongest cat in the room talking about who's going to pick this up, what do the rest of us pretty much decide is not going to happen? We can't. It ain't going to get moved, right? <laughs> he can't pick it up. So a strong angel says, who's going to open up this book? Because I can't. Oh, he gets, real, he gets more complete. Next verse, please. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Wait, wait, wait. Now I got a question. It must be something else up in that scroll for you to be so concerned that it not get open. You go to cry. Any insight what's in the scroll? I hear history. Future. I hear future. What's that, ma'am? Names. <laughs> Everything. Next verse, please. Then one, do, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Oh, please continue. You're getting to the real good part. Further? 
Yes, ma'am. Continue, please. I'm sorry. Then I saw the, a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Uh -huh. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. Verse 7, real slow. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, mm -hmm. which are the prayers of God's people. So John is crying. And who comes to him and says, stop crying? And what did the angel tell him? Why did the angel tell him to stop crying? Because Jesus is here, right? Yeah, right. So, so, so when we cry today, guess what the ministering spirit trying to tell us? Worry about it, Jesus. He, he got it. So Jesus comes, he takes the scroll, and then when he takes the scroll, how do the beast and the 420 elders respond? They fought. Why would they worship him? Because he took the scroll. But why would you worship somebody for taking the scroll? Because he's the one. Hold on, hold on. We got to give Chap a mic. We, got, we have three mics over here. Can I borrow one? You keep yours. May I have the purple or the red? Either one. Oh, you're good. Okay, we're going to leave this over here with you, Sister Mary. So the text is very clear that in the beginning, the Bible says no one was able to open the throne. Until the lamb shows up, so he opens the scroll. He's the only one. Why? Because he's the only one that has ever been able to fight sin and conquer it. He's the only one that has truly gained victory over the mystery of sin and its implicit power that is at work in our world. So, so chap, I want to put a pin there because I want to come back. Let's put a hook. When John first sees Jesus in Revelation 1, what does Jesus say he had? Yeah. He had some keys. And what were the keys to? Death. death and the grave or hell. Anytime death is around, what do we know is there? Sin. And so those angels or those beasts and especially those sinners, they need to get up in that scroll because it revolves around the declaration of righteousness that only Jesus can make because he's the one that paid the price. So he's the only one that has the right to declare sinners righteous uh, in the eyes of God in the judgment. Wait, wait, wait. So now you just help me understand why John was crying. Because John was like, oh, if don't nobody open that up. <laughs> We're all yes, doomed. We all, we all doomed. I cried some crocodile tears too. <laughs> Y'all remember what Paul said over in Corinth? If Christ didn't come up out of the grave, we are most miserable creatures. Yes, ma'am. Now, let, let's, now, Sister Lois, we got 10 minutes. Since you're going to take us to the garden, this hooks back up into Wednesday's and Thursday's lesson. I think, I think also that the elders realize that because of Jesus, when the scrolls were opened, that they are where they are. How do we, what evidence do we have that the 4 and 20 elders realize that because of Jesus, they are where they are? What have they done that proves that? They took their crowns off and cast yes. them at his feet. And so you know what Jesus is winning for you? Mm -hmm. It's all about him. Mm -hmm. Now, you took us to the garden, Sister Lois. What I'd like for us to do is jump down to verse 12, and let's see what these angels and elders are saying their their song interests me their words interest me in First, a loud voice they uh, were saying worthy uh -huh. is the lamb who was slain to receive power 
and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Uh-huh. Oh, no, no, you got to continue because they kept talking. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Mm -hmm. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. Now, you say amen to what's true, right? All right. Now, we want to end with the most interesting connection. Because in the garden, Sister Lois, God promised something. God told the devil that he was going to put enmity between his seed and the seed of the woman. Can anyone tell me in two minutes what that meant? What was God telling the devil he was going to do? When you put enmity between something, what are you doing? All right. Now, if God had to put war between them and hatred between them, what must have existed after the fruit was eaten? All right, let me, let me say this one more time. Can I pick on Sister Hardaway? So if, 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 if Sister Lula says she's going to put enmity, war, hatred between me and Sister Hardaway, what must exist between me and Sister Hardaway? No, if that's what, that's what, she, that's what Sister Lois is going to do, Sister Lula. I, we must really get along if you're going to make me hate her. All right? Well, when God tells the devil, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed, what must exist, have existed after they ate the fruit? How much, how must sinners have felt about the devil? Oh, just loving it. All right? But God says, my seed, Christ, he's going to crush your head. You won't call him a little pain too. He's gonna bruise his heel. All right. Does Jesus come to this earth in human form? I mean, he, he he was frequent in here, but in human form. And does he live? Y'all yep. sure about that? Y'all act like y'all not sure. Jesus came down here. Did they put him on the cross? Yep. Did he come up out of the grave? Amen. That was good stuff, wasn't it? Getting ready to leave. This is Thursday's lesson. And the disciples, they knew the time was short. And what do they ask Jesus in Acts 2? Anybody remember? Oh, Lord, are you about to, when are you going to set your kingdom up? They still don't get it. But then what did Jesus promise them? And he told them to go where? Before they went, where did he tell them to go? Let's read. Let's read. Acts chapter 1, because there, there is a scriptural precedence here that I think we really messes us up in evangelism today. Acts chapter 1. Somebody read for us 6, 7, and 8. Oh, certainly. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Mm -hmm. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Mm -mm. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. Mm -hmm. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, he told them they would receive power. When would they receive power? When he went. And if we go back to John 14, 15, and 16, when was the Holy Ghost going to come in more a fuller measure? The pun at Pentecost. No, but when was he going to come? Remember Jesus says... Yeah, Jesus says, Jesus says now, I'm going to go back to the Father. And when I go back, that's when he's showing up more fully. Y'all catching this? So on Pentecost, when it happens, 
Why do you think the disciples were bouncing off the walls? See, we get caught up in understanding all them languages. Mm -mm. You know, because they, every tribe, you know, all some heard in their language. Why do you think Peter and them got so bold? I got you. I got you. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. But, 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 yes, sir. The reason it happened is because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Right, right. I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. But why were they bouncing off the walls when the Spirit showed up? Chap. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. And why were they winners? Wait, 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 wait. If I tell you all I'm going to Jamaica. <laughs> and when I get there, I'm sending you back some souvenirs. When them souvenirs show up in the mail, what do you know? That ain't a bad, that's a bad example. You know why? Because you can get Jamaican souvenirs. And you don't have to be in Jamaica. But what Jesus promised could not happen unless he was there. Brother Roy. It was confirmation. One of the best stories I've heard in this space, you know, prior to the internet and prior to mobile devices and prior to satellite phones, when people did expeditions, they would have carrier pigeons. And whenever they arrived, they would take the pigeon and send it back to let folk know they had gotten, to, especially guys who were, you know, going to Antarctica and this kind of stuff. And we're told many a story when those pigeons came back and folks saw that bird, they get hyped because they know the folk were where they're supposed to be. Yes, ma'am. And I don't even know if that one's on. Yeah, hook us up. Jesus also made him a promise that he would go and prepare a place for them and then he would come back. So when the Holy Spirit came, they knew he was there and he would have been fulfilling his promise to them. Sister, Sister Tamika, I thought you was going to put that big fish hook on us. See, when they got, when the Holy Spirit came in full of measure, they knew he was there. But to Brother Chap's point, they knew he, they had won. Because he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back. That's where the boldness came from. It didn't come from, uh, no, it was the fact that, oh, Jesus got our back. He up there. So can nothing happen to us now because he's coming back. No I ain't no fear. That, that's, that's it. Sister Lois, that's some powerful stuff. Yes, ma'am. Uh, soon and very soon, we are going to become a part of that community. How are we going to act? Are we going to be able to say holy, holy, worthy? Are we going to be able to do that? Are we practicing this now in order to get to that point? Now, Sister Lois, you know the hard-headed of us. I have another question. How do I get as hyped and as bold and as committed as those brothers did, I must possibly look to the same confirmations. If the Spirit is working in my life, that means he's at the right hand of the Father, which means he's in heaven, which means John 14 is true. If he's in heaven, he's coming back. So it really affects how I live my life. Brother Roy, you got last point. We close with prayer. Oh, my bad. It's, 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 it's what should drive us every day. Then could, we, <clears throat> then could we assume, and I'm saying assume, that every individual in this room 
when they die, Jesus has come. Because the next thing, that's who they're going to see, you know? So, so, so I'll end with this, Sister Nancy. When they die, we can scripturally validate. Mm -hmm. They sleep like I sleep. Right. I don't care what's going on when I'm sleeping. All I'm waiting on is to get, excuse the bad English, woke up. Mm -hmm. And so all that matters while they're sleeping right. is the time when they get woke up. Because okay. the one waking them is Jesus. Is what's up. Right. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for just having given us a glimpse of what's going on in heaven right now. We ask that you would empower us to internalize it, that your spirit would write it upon our minds so we can face each day with confidence, knowing that, Lord God, you have the keys of death and hell. You are indeed the one worthy of opening up the scrolls. And Lord, of the scroll, and Lord, you are indeed the one who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, having dispatched ministering spirits to minister unto us, all in preparation for the simple fact that you're coming back. Lord, help that be on our mind for the rest of our lives, every moment of every day. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
day we've got. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity we have on this special day to worship the Lord. We like to uh, start our children's uh, worship service by singing a little song called, My God is So Big. Yes. And uh, sometimes we don't realize how big he is. So can we get the children to grab your baskets and collect the funds as you come up? The funds is used for our worthy student fund, so please the give liberally. baskets there in the back. And please join in with us as we sing this song. God is so good and so big. My God, God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. He made the seas, He made the trees, He made the elephants too. My God is so big, so strong and so He made the skies, the birds that fly, He made the butterflies too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. He made the dogs, He made the frogs, He made the panda bear too. My God is so big. Strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. He made the sun that shine so bright, He made the stars for the night. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Now there's another one. That's called, oh, friend, do you love Jesus? And um, let's see, uh, there's, there's kind of a response there, isn't there? And when uh, they says, oh, boys, do you love Jesus? Then I think we need to stand up, and young men, and say, yes, I love Jesus. And if it says to the girls, do you love Jesus? Well, then we need, well, the girls need to stand up and say, oh, yes, we love Jesus. All right, are we ready? Oh, friend, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Why do you love Jesus? Why I love Jesus? Because he first loved me. Everybody. Oh, how I love Jesus. Remember, yes. when we ask you the question, you respond by doing what? Standing up. All right. Okay. Are you ready? Oh, oh girls, do, do you love, love Jesus? Jesus? Yes, we love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Well, now we love Jesus. Well, love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. All right, guys, this is your turn. Oh, boys, do you love Jesus? Are you sure you love Jesus? Are you sure you love Jesus? This is why we love Jesus. Because he first loves me.
wonderful Great job. job. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Okay. Raise your hand if you know about angels. Okay. Well, we all know that God used angels to help people. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think God used animals to help people? Right. He do. And I'm going to tell, tell you about a story, um, show you how God used animals. Okay, one day I came home from work, and I was real tired, and I, I was taking off my work clothes, and I noticed uh, we have a little dog. Her name is Myla. She was in a cage, and she was looking very sad. So I know that she probably was in the cage all day, right? So I tried to play with her through the cage, but she didn't want to play. She, wanted, she was hitting at the latch. She wanted to get out the cage, right? So I said, okay, well, let me... Um, when I finish uh, taking off my work clothes, I'm going to let out the cage, let her run around outside. So I took out the cage, and I let her outside, and she's running around the yard 100 miles an hour, and she's playing. So I closed the door, and I noticed she started barking. Now, Miles, she always barks, so I didn't think nothing of it, but this bark was a little aggressive. She went, she, for two or three minutes. So I looked through the window, and I noticed she's standing by the road, looking across the street, barking with her tail up. So I'm like, okay, what is she barking at? And all of a sudden, she shoot across the highway. So we stay off of a busy highway. And I'm thinking, you got 18 wheelers. I'm thinking she can get hit by a car. So I open the door. Marla, get over here. She ignores me. She, she, she's run, I, I can't see what she's doing across the street because we have bushes in our front yard. And then I noticed I seen a guy walking on the opposite side of the road. And Marla was running around his feet, trying to jump on him and play. So I said, Marla, get over here now. And she looked at me like, if you don't stop calling me, <laughs> and turned her head and started back playing. So now I'm mad. Now I got to put on, put on my shoes, and I got to go get, get her. So I got dressed. I put on my shoes. I hopped in the car. And by the time I was going down the road, the guy, he branched off of the street off of the highway, right? So I pull, I, I pull up, park, uh, bust the right, park the car. I open the door. Myla runs to me. But then when she ran to me, I went to grab her. She shot back towards the highway because she wanted to play tag or whatever. So now she's running around doing circles in the highway. And I'm like, she's going to get hit by a car. Her 18 was there, not going to slow down because I see dead deers all the time. So I'm thinking she's going to get hit by a car, right? So the guy turns around and he helps me catch Myla. He put his hand to the road and Myla came up to him. He picked her up and he brought her to me. So I said, thank you and things like that. And he said, hey, um, he introduced himself. I, I tell him who I am. He said, uh, do you, uh, how far is Montgomery from here? I said, Montgomery? I said, it's like 30 minutes down this way in a car going 65 miles an hour. And he, he was walking. And it's, it's about to be sunset, probably like 20 minutes before it get dark. And he said, well, um, he, he was, he's from Chicago. He was traveling to Florida. And halfway there, he got into an argument with his friend. And he got out of the car, and the friend left him. So now he's walking back trying to get to Montgomery to get to a bus station and go back home. And now I'm listening to his story, and I got to be cautious, too, because, you know, some people lie a lot. So, so I'm listening to his story, and he said, can you take me to the bus station? And I'm like, um, I, and I told the truth. I said, well, my family, you know, we about to eat dinner and all. <laughs> you know, so he was like, okay, well, can you do me this favor? He said, can you dial this number and ask him, can they turn around and pick me up? That I can do. So I hop in the car. And I go home, and I dial the number, and no one picks up. She calls back. I said, hello? And I, I told her who the guy was, and I said, he wanted to know if you could turn around. And she told me, you tell him that we already in Florida, that I'm not turning around. He better call somebody else to come pick him up and get him. Now, keep in mind, I, I, I went too fast. Before he told me to call, he told me to tell the lady, make it sound bad so she can turn around. And I'm looking like... So you're from Chicago. You don't know how, how, how dark, how, how the country darkness look, but it is bad. You walking. <laughs> and I told him, I said, if well, you hold your hand in front of your face, you're not going to be able to see your hands. And the highway doesn't have sidewalks, so I don't have to make it look bad. This is a bad situation. All right, so fast forward back. Okay, so I call her, and, of course, she, she's not going to turn around. And I'm like, now nah, i got to call him and tell her she said no. And God spoke to me and said, this is sincere. He's being honest. Take them to the bus stop. So I come in the house. We put the food in the uh, microwave and things like that. And um, the, uh, my wife and the kids get in the car just in case something happened. You know, they got my back, right? <laughs> so um, 
And we got in the car, and I drove him to Montgomery, and I let him see the darkness, how, how dark it get in the country. And I told him, this is what you would have been walking in. And I took him to the bus stop, and hopefully he got to Chicago safe. But I let Mile out at the right time. And he just so happened to be right in front of my house. He'd been walking all morning. So somehow God set it up. I let Mile out, and Mile ran around him. And Because um, if I would have seen him walking, I would have think he was just walking home. But God did use my dog to save someone. All right. Would anyone like to pray? All right, bow your head. Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to uh, come together this Sabbath. Lord, we just pray that you be with us um, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Watch over us, protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may go to your seats. Morning and happy Sabbath. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes. Amen. That's right. Clapping over here. Hallelujah for that, right? Amen. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And it's beautiful to see so many faces. I had a chance to greet this morning. I don't normally greet. I don't know why. I guess too many greeters out there, but I did. And so this morning I saw happy faces coming into the sanctuary and I saw several visitors. We've got visitors from Maxwell Air Force Base that have been visiting for a while. Guys, thank you for being here. We honor your service, and we want to salute you today. Blessings to you. Just thank you for worshiping with us today. Amen. And I know that another young lady came in, and she was looking for a church, and um, her kid went to uh, the primary, and I said, don't look any further. You found a church right here. Jamaica. Don't you agree? Yes. Amen. Sisters, good to have you here this morning as well. So several of you here. And Cynthia... Thank you for putting up those new pictures. If you haven't had a chance to see the new pictures on the wall, when you come in, check them out. Your face might be up there. There are ministries going on all the time, so we want to celebrate that. Thank you for that as well. And also, uh, Karen and is trying to put together a new, Roy, thank you for that story. That was awesome. A new church directory. And so what happens is that we need to make sure that your information is correct. So Tamika is out there trying to get folks as they come in. I forgot half of you, so I'm not used to greeting, and I forgot. So when you leave, check with Tamika to make sure that your information goes correct in the directory, okay? That will make you happy, and it will make our church happy as well. Um, also, I want to point out quickly, we have, um, as you know, every Monday morning and Wednesday morning and Friday morning, we have an online prayer service. It's where we worship. It's a few of us that get together, and we bring up the, the, the needs of this church before the Lord. And so in here, you'll find a focus list that you, who are not joining with us on that prayer line, can pray for. So the whole church essentially is praying for the same thing. Amen? Amen. And God hears that. He honors that. So I want to invite you to do that as well. Most of all, we want to invite you to worship our Lord and Savior today. Because he's here waiting for our worship. Amen? Amen. And I have one other announcement before we start. Um, I'm passing out the tax statement, so if you have not gotten your tax statement, please see me before you leave. I want to get those in your hand that saves on postage. Let's stand together and sing our call to worship.
a special day this Sabbath is. We're so thankful that you set apart a special day that you could meet with us. And we ask that as we gather together here to worship you, your presence will fill this sanctuary and that it will change us and guide us and make us into the individuals you'd want us to be. Bless everything of this day we ask in Jesus' name. Today, our focus is on religious liberty. Have you guys ever looked at a penny? You know, I think when we talk about religious liberty, we unfortunately, in many instances, take a premature position of confrontation. We talk about legal teams and our rights. I would encourage us to take more of a scriptural posture but what's most fascinating is when you meet people who are in decision-making positions. It's how ignorant they are of what the scriptures actually say on what a saint of God and how he or she should posture themselves towards authority. Too often all they know is what some renegade or some cavalier individual does. And they know very little of how much counsel God gives in his word on how we're supposed to engage with civil authorities. And it's amazing when they find out that the very Bible that sometimes they are a little tempted not to embrace tells the saints of God they must give honor where honor is due. That God is the one who's put people in authority and that we should be submitted to them. When they find out that the scriptures don't have such a confrontational view of government when they read the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, when they read the stories of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and they understand that saints of God don't really have a problem working for the government in its upper echelons. It's amazing how disarming those truths are to dissolving the need for a legal team. Same can be said about your employer. When they find out that the Bible actually says when we work, we need to be working as if God is our boss. I know no employer that's going to turn that down. Amen. So when you're thinking about all that, remember the penny. For there are a couple of groups that wanted Jesus to have a confrontational view with the Roman government. They say, Jesus, we know you tell the truth and you don't care anything about any man. And that we should only serve God. How should we deal with the Romans? Jesus says, hand me that penny. Whose inscription's on there? They said, Caesar. He says, well, then you give Caesar what's Caesar's. And you give God's what's God's. And you know the irony of that? If we give God's what's God's, he tells us how we ought to give Caesar what's Caesar's. That's religious liberty at its finest with the deacons. Let us pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for us to live in a place where we have the privilege and the honor as the Apostle Paul engaged with Festus and King Agrippa in sharing just how good you are. You've given us also that opportunity and privilege. Help us to give accordingly. Bless these funds. Allow them to be used in the purposes for which you desire. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
to stand together again and sing uh, our hymn of worship. There is a wideness. Yes. In God's mercy. Amen. may be seated. There's a wideness in God's mercy. A songwriter writes this song about the love of God. He talks about if the ocean were ink and the sky the backdrop for writing, that all of the ink and the ocean and writing it against the sky, we could write forever and never describe the love of God. God's mercies, the wideness of his mercies, based on his love, ever flowing, not narrow, enough to encircle the whole world, which means it encircles you and me. Amen. I thank God for his mercies. I thank God for his love. I thank God for answers prayer because it's because of his mercy that he answers prayers. Amen? Yes. Bob, you're going to share a story with us today about answered prayer. Yes, sir. This is a story. I'm going to offer you proof that God answers prayer. Uh... A while back, my wife was diagnosed with cancer, but that's been taken care of. That's one prayer that's been answered. Amen. 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 More recently, uh, my son-in-law and daughter both worked for the State Department of Education. My son-in-law is an attorney, a very good one. He can practice in four states. He was asked to do an investigation by the superintendent two superintendents ago, uh, because there was a rumor that some people had gotten together to prevent another individual from getting a position by manipulating records, rumors, and, and such. He did the investigation, very good investigation, and brought out the fact that something was done. He unearthed a few skeletons in the closet. That superintendent left, a new one came in, an interim, 
and transferred my son-in-law from the position he had to a position that was not so good for a lot of reasons. The main reason was the place he got transferred to, the people didn't want him there. The new superintendent came in and on the very first day called my daughter in who had been working for the State Department for 25 years and had nothing but glowing reports on her work ethics. He called her in like at 11 o'clock in the morning and he said, you're terminated. I'm eliminating your position. Of course, we all went into shock. Hers was the only position eliminated. Politics had reared its ugly head. She was out of a job. My son-in-law was in a place where they were making things very, very difficult for him. They manipulated the rules. And he had to leave. So I had a daughter with no job, I had a son-in-law with no job, and I was in a total state of shock. I prayed, I talked to God, I said, Lord, I can feed him and I can give him a place to rest, but I can't pay the mortgage, I can't make the car payments, and I don't know how I'm going to support my two grandsons, one 16-year-old and an 18-year-old, both in school. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing happened. I said, okay, I understand. You've got a plan, but I sure would like a clue. <laughs> About four or five months went by. My daughter had interviewed for a I think three or four jobs, nothing happened. Now, mind you, my son-in-law is now out of that job. She doesn't have a job. I didn't know what was going to happen. And then I'm sitting home one day, and the phone rings, and it's my daughter. She says, Daddy, I got a call. People want to hire me basically doing what I was doing with the State Department. However, this is not a State Department job, so it's away from the state job. I get another call from her. Somebody else wanted her, and they hired her. So now she had two jobs, and she's on the horns of a dilemma because she has accepted the first job, and the second job is a part-time job, but it's still going to require her to be on the road February and March. It's got something to do with testing with schools. She told that to the employer who hired her full time and they said, Tracy, we'll work it out. We still want you to work here. So what I'm telling you is, uh, and I've been around a few decades, so I want to tell you now that I look back on some other things that have happened in my life, I fully realize that all this talk about answered prayer is not false. Amen. Amen. Now, I read the scriptures. I read the books. Mm -hmm. But I was in law enforcement for 25 years, so you might consider me a, a person who looks at things with maybe a jaundiced eye because of what I dealt with. But I am very proud and happy to say today, when Jesus speaks or has spoken, don't even worry about it. Amen. You may be cold and you may be hungry, but somehow, some way, it's going to be okay. And a part of the blessing that I want to tell you about my son-in-law is a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force Reserves. As a result of him not having a job, he was able to complete war college in a short amount of time. Sometimes, I don't know how long it normally takes, but he did it with correspondence courses, and he just finished it. As a result of that, through his reserve unit, next Sunday, he leaves to go down to uh, Tyndall, 
or Tyndale, however you pronounce I was in the Marine Corps, so I don't know Air Force terms. He's going down to Florida for two months, for full-time pay for two months, to get some kind of certification that will allow him to do something to do with the air traffic or air, whatever it is in the Air Force that he's going to do. But they're going to give him money for two months, which I'm happy. <laughs> We are so happy. Now, we don't know what the two months is going to bring to him. He's been activated two times already, one time for a four-year stretch and another time for an eight-month stretch over in the bad place. So if, if you're struggling with something and you have any doubt, and even when you read, you say, come on, God, I need help. Remember today what Bob Manzo said. Jesus doesn't lie. What he says he's going to do, he's going to do. So I want to ask you, if you've got something on your mind, on your heart, some, some problem that you're not getting any resolution for, come on down. Let's have a prayer. If you don't want to come down, that's okay too. But pray with us in your seats. Ask God to help you out. God answers prayer, my friends. God answers prayer. We invite you down to praise and pray this morning. Let us kneel. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds. Spend a few moments with silent prayer, and then Bob will have his prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you as a corporate body, unified in prayer, as in the Old Testament when they sprayed the incense, Lord, to make the prayers, the prayers rise up so that they would be heard by you in heaven. I ask that the prayers that are being offered today do the same as the incense and lift up into your heavenly throne so that you may act upon them. And Lord, as humans, we're impatient. We want everything now. And I speak for myself, Lord. We know that somehow, some way, whatever your plan is, it will come to fruition. Lord, I ask for mercy and kindness of everybody here, every member of our church, and that you give us the patience and wisdom to wait on you and be still so we know that you are the Lord, the King, the Creator. Without you, we would not exist, Lord, and we hope, we pray so much that your coming is soon because we're tired. Every time we pick up the paper, every time we turn on the TV, there's nothing but evil. Innocent people losing their lives over nothing. Lord, it's time. Please help us. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline that ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen.
I just love it when God works. The Holy Spirit, I don't, you know, I don't talk to people. I do my thing. They do theirs. But it's amazing how things work together. It's already been happening. You'll see. It's okay. I wondered why I changed my sermons this week. Anyway, our scripture comes from Nehemiah. We actually have two scriptures, so we're going to read Nehemiah first, though. Uh, turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. And we're going to read the first three verses there and then turn quickly to Matthew 10, verse 16. In the New King James Version today, I read... But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned. Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. And he said, <laughs> whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then turning to Matthew, chapter 10, and verse 16, the words of Jesus, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Let's pray. Father in heaven, conflict is inevitable. We see Nehemiah in his work and he faces conflict. He faces opposition. But Lord, it is Jesus that shows us the way out. It's Jesus that shows us how to deal with conflict. And Nehemiah, inspired by your spirit, doesn't do too bad either. So may we learn lessons from both today as we open this part of Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A week from tomorrow... In the evening, two teams will get together. The last two teams standing. The New England Patriots will face the Los Angeles Rams for what is one of the biggest sporting events in America called, there you go, the Super Bowl. Now let me play a hypothetical situation for you. What do you know about football? What kind of sport is football? A contact or non-contact sport? Yeah, two teams lining up opposite each other, hitting each other on purpose, all game long, and I hear that they're pretty sore at the end of that. Especially in the Super Bowl. I mean, this is it. This is what you've done all that stuff all season long to get to, right? So let me, like I said, let me take you into a hypothetical situation. They come out for the coin flip, captain for the New England Patriots, captain for the Los Angeles Rams. The coin is flipped and they say, huh, you won the toss. You know what? Somebody's got to win anyway. And, uh, you know, 
we'd feel a lot better if we just let you win the game then. Call it the coin toss. Okay, it's over. Let's go home. Really? Are you kidding me? Or how about this one? Uh, we're gathered here in the mid in the midfield, and 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 we we want to want to negotiate a little here. Uh, why don't we let you score, and then we'll, you let us score, and just as long as we score one more than you? Can we negotiate that? Are you kidding? It is a contact for it, right? They are going to play the game. They are going to hit each other. So that's if you're going to play pro football, you're going to be sore the next day. That's the nature of the game. Could it be that if you're going to play pro Christianity, you're going to have to face some contact? What did Jesus say? Behold, I send you out a sheep in the midst of wolves. Is that true for everyone or just the disciples in the first century? So it's no surprise, no surprise at all, that Nehemiah is getting started with his wall building stuff. And what's the first thing that happens? Conflict, right? First thing that happens, he's building, he's doing something good. In fact, we could have gone back to even when he arrives, those guys said, oh, somebody's here to do something good for him? Ooh, we don't like this guy. See? I mean, from the get-go, he hadn't even done anything. He hadn't even taken that three-day wait and toured the wall and all that. Right from the moment he arrives, they don't like him. So it's no surprise that Nehemiah runs into trouble. It's no surprise that Jesus rem would remind us that Christianity is a contact sport. There will be trouble. There are sheep, that's us, and there are wolves, and that's out there. So while we know that trouble is inevitable, what we do about it is also very simple. So I want us to look at both Nehemiah's response and Jesus' advice. And I want to look at them together today because I think together we can see something that we often, you know, I, I say all the time, it's sometimes what you read together rather than just what you read in the Bible. Sometimes as you're reading one scripture and you're read to another scripture, they just, they start doing that and it fits. Besides that, every time you preach the Old Testament, you have to find Christ in it somewhere, right? But let's start with Nehemiah. Right after the scripture we just read here, the first three verses, they're mocking the Jews, they're mocking the wall building. What's, what's the response of Nehemiah? Verse 4, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Notice he doesn't say, I'm going to get you guys. He turns to the only really right place to turn. He says, God, would you take care of this for me? Is there a power in prayer that's better than the... Absolutely. Nehemiah does the right thing. He doesn't go, you know what, we're going to get our, our guys, and we're gonna, they're going to get their guys, and we're going to have a football game here. Only there might be a little bit blood spill. No. He says, God, you see what they're doing? By the way, let me remind you that in the Super Bowl, there will be three teams. Yes, three teams. There's the New England Patriots, 
there's the Los Angeles Rams, and then there's those guys with the stripes. Now, they're supposed to be fair and impartial, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna go. <laughs> but you know, that's their job. And God is the ultimate referee. You got problems? You got trouble? Say, hey, throw the flag. Say, hey, 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 God, hey, hey. I want a review of that play. Come on, that's not fair. Only God doesn't ever, ever, hear me well, ever mess, a call, mess up a call. He never misses. He always, it may look like he didn't see it, but he saw it. He saw it. And he's going to get it right. Just keep, just keep that in mind. So Nehemiah turns to God in prayer, the right thing to do, the right person to appeal to. But then verse 6, so we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. He turned to prayer, and as I said all the way through this series, he didn't just pray, he turned to prayer, and then he got back to work. There's two things you always have to do. You have to turn to God in prayer, and then you keep going. You don't just say, well, now I'm just going to pray all day about this. No, you pray and then you get busy and keep going because in the process of going, God will answer your prayers. Jesus also said that too. Matthew 26. You're going to have to kind of be back and forth, but that's, that's okay. Exercise your fingers. Matthew 26. We're going to look at, starting with verse 38. Matthew 26, 38. This is the garden. He said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Then you drop down to verse 40. They've been sleeping. They haven't been watching. Verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? And then he has two things. Verse 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus even has this this two-point job. You pray, watch, is the action, watch, and pray. He never says, now just pray, that's all you have to do. He says, watch, and pray. Watch, and pray. So even Jesus gives us the answer, we need both prayer and action. Prayer and action. Well, Nehemiah continues to talk about what the people were saying. Going back to Nehemiah chapter 4, we have, starting with verse 10, Then Judah said, these are the people around him, The strength of the laborers is failing. Have you ever felt tired out when you're engaged in an intense prayer and action campaign and people are opposing you. Have you ever gotten worn out with that? <laughs> That's what they're saying. The strength of the laborers is failing and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. We are getting tired. And our adversaries, verse 11 said, they will neither know or see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. Verse 12, so it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came, they told us 10 times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. So here are the people saying, we are so, what? Scared. We're so scared because they've been telling us, you'll never know what hits you. You ever, you ever had anybody threaten you that way? You'll never know what hits you. It'll just be over. 
Did they have a legitimate fear? Was there a lot of rubbish around? Absolutely. Could they sneak up on them? Absolutely. Not MacArthur. MacArthur's Hill, where we used to live, he put his headquarters up on a mountain, then he cleared miles, literally took the jungles out, miles and miles out from Sentani, Irian Jaya. I used to fly in that area, but on Sabbath afternoon, we would go up on MacArthur's Hill, and you can still see to this day because the jungle has not grown back. You can still see just miles and miles of just grass. No trees, just grass. Nobody, but nobody was going to sneak up on MacArthur in New Guinea. But they could for these, these guys. So they had a problem. Again, what does Nehemiah do? It's been told, he, you know, they're going to sneak up on us. Notice what, how he responds in verse 14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Don't be afraid. By the way, it wasn't just let's fight, because you drop down to verse 20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will what? Fight for us. You see, there's sometimes you can't fight it out. There are sometimes when you have to depend on what God can do. But he says, don't be afraid. God will fight for us. Matthew 10. Does Jesus say something similar? Hmm. I wonder. I think he does. Let's go to Matthew 10, verses 19 and 20. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Father, Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. And then, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. You see, Jesus comes to us with the same message. When you think that they're going to sneak up, when you think that it's just coming out of nowhere, when you are just plain afraid, he says, do not fear. By the way, what is this life? Because I heard you, right as I was coming in, you were setting me up. You're talking about, hey, just, it's just the wake-up time, right? What happens if they kill the body? <laughs> not much. You just get to skip over some. I'll tell you, you won't miss anything of this old world. You're not going to miss a thing. Nothing important while you're sleeping, okay? So just forget about, oh, I'm going to miss, uh, forget it. It's not worth worrying over. If you have to sleep for a little while, Jesus says, don't you worry. Don't be afraid. So Jesus gives us the promise that it's okay. But back to Nehemiah. You know, the enemy tries threatening first, right? He always comes and he says, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. But if you, if you react properly to that and you don't get afraid, he'll do something else. And that's what Nehemiah faced. Turn to Nehemiah 6. 
after they couldn't get him frightened, they turned to something else. And it's the, one of the devil's favorite tactics after he can't frighten you into submission. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now it happened when Sembalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and that there were no breaks left in it. See, they couldn't get through, to, through to him now. Though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Samballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they had an ambush waiting, see. Still had something up their sleeve. But let's talk. You see, if, if you won't submit to the, I'm going to just get you, well, okay, that doesn't work. Let's negotiate. Let's negotiate. It gets a lot of people. It gets a lot of people because it seems like the easy way out. Okay, this is going to be easier. We don't have to fight for touchdowns. We can just negotiate touchdowns. Right. They're going to just let us score. Right. That's just what they're saying. Don't get suckered into that. You're going to get out there and they're still going to knock you down. But the devil will always try to get you to talk. You know, the more people talk, the more chance there is for your, your compromise. So don't even get started in the first place. Let's notice what his answer is. So he sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it to go down to you and talk? You know what? It's the answer you always answer with when somebody says, let's just talk. Uh, I, got a, I, I got a great work to do. I'm, I'm so busy. I, you know, I don't have time for all that talk. I don't have time for all that. You know what? I don't have time for all that. You just want to occupy my time. Talk, 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 talk. And when you're all done, you're still trying to bend me to your will. <sighs> you know? You're not listening. I'm talking too, but you're not listening. You're still just, bye, 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 bye. You know? You've talked to people like that? You know? They're just waiting for you to quit so they can get, <laughs> come on. It's a waste of time. And Nehemiah says it. Look, I, I, you know, I'm doing a great work. I cannot stop. And you're not going to frighten me that way either. Your, your ambush is not going to work. I am going to stay on the wall where I'm safe, and I'm going to get this job done. By the way, there's no greater work than being like Jesus. There's no greater work than, than staying in the vineyard and doing what he asks us to do. There's no greater work. You can't convince people by talking to them anyway, sometimes. You can't argue anybody into anything, I'll tell you that. I have tried that too many times. It doesn't work. You'd think that'd be the end of it. You'd think they have given up by now. They tried the forceful method, they tried the negotiation method, but they weren't done. Let's go down to verse 5. Then Sembalat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Gisham says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. We're going to tell on you. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Still getting to try to talk, but this time by spreading rumors. Have you ever tried to chase rumors down? Have you ever tried to correct somebody who's put out a rumor to stop you? Have you ever tried to get to the bottom of it? That's as bad as sitting down and trying to talk in the first place. You will never get it cleared up. And the rumors are still out there. You know, I meet some rumors that I saw on the internet 15, 20, 30 years ago. They're still floating around. And I still get people, oh, I heard that. You know, I'm going, oh, come on. That's, that's, been, proven, that's been proven over and over. That's, that's just garbage. Don't get, on, don't get on the internet to get all your facts, please. That's, that's the last place to go. 
Just stay on the, stay on the job. And, and so he simply responds, verse 8, I, said, I sent to them saying, no such things as you say are being done. You invent them in your heart. He just calls it like it is. For they were trying to make us afraid. There it is. In fact, don't you notice a theme here? Don't you notice that it's all a tactic of what? Fear. That's all the devil tries to do is, make, is scare you into things. So let me tell you something. If you are being pressured into something, there's only one being behind that. And it ain't, ain't Jesus or the Holy Spirit. He's the other guy. And he's trying to pressure you and push you. And that's, you know, but sometimes we're distracted by rumors. And so we try hard to prove them wrong. And all we end up doing is chasing the devil ra devil's rabbits, as my dad used to say. Chasing the devil's rabbits. And he puts out more rabbits than you can ever catch. Just when you think you've caught them all. Hop, hop, hop. There goes another one. <laughs> Let God take care of rumors. He's got a way of taking care of rumors in his own time. Let's go to that one. Matthew 10 again. This time, verse 26. Have you noticed, too, in this chapter of Matthew 10, he's always talking about fear, too, Jesus? There's a reason. Verse 26, therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered, the rumor, that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. God has a way of, you know, all those things are running around. You're trying to fix them. One day he's just going to go, hey, see that? There. It's a rumor, everyone in the universe. And the mask will even be torn off that old serpent himself. And everyone will finally see the rat he really is. Right now he's running around hiding you know, he's making it look like he's an angel of light, right? That's what the Bible says. He runs around in the religion game. Oh, I'm just so good. Well, one day, whew, the mass is gone, and the whole gig is up. But it's God's doing. He does it. So don't you try to do his job. You try to do what he's given you to do. And you let him do what he's going to do later, Okay? So Nehemiah's path to greatness is single-minded focus on prayer and action, regardless of the opposition, never letting anything come between him and what God wanted him to do. But Jesus takes us beyond just the single-mindedness in prayer. He takes us to one more, he takes us one more step. Matthew 10, I think you probably didn't turn the page, I did, because I'm used to having my hand over Nehemiah. Excuse me a second while I get back to Matthew 10. This time, we want to come to the very end of what he was telling his disciples. Saying what we've been saying all along, do not think, verse 34, do not think that I came to bring, a, to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, here's the step beyond Nehemiah. Because Jesus points to something much bigger than even just prayer and action. He adds love. He says there is nothing as strong as the power of love to finish the whole thing in the end. And you have to come to love me so much 
that all the other stuff just blurs into the background and you don't even see it anymore. And you lose your life in me. So don't be afraid. One more time back to Nehemiah. I want to go back to that one verse. In Nehemiah chapter 4. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, verse 19, I said to the nobles and rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. So even it's implied here. Rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Even he has love and fellowship because he pulls the people back. In trouble, he pulls them together. Nehemiah tells them to press together, to rally to each other, to not leave each other out there, to face whatever they face on their corner of the wall. We have to get through this together, folks. Even Nehemiah has it, but you have to see what he's really saying between them, because he doesn't explicit say, explicitly say, okay, guys, love one another, help one another, right? But Nehemiah tells them, press together. The worst thing you can do when it comes to God's work is to try to do it all by yourself. Recently, I was reminded by someone not to try to do everything myself as the pastor. And it's a person I respect very, very much. We must at times rally to the trumpet call for help. In God's work, there are always times when we drop everything we're doing and rally to someone and to someone's aid that really needs it. At that time, they are facing a battle on their section of the wall, and we go and help them. And we don't worry that ours isn't getting done at the, that moment. We just leave it and say, okay, you really need help. But the final point, you see, as I said, fear is the big thing in both accounts. Fear is the big thing in Nehemiah, and fear is the big thing with Jesus. And he's sending his disciples out, and he's just told them, you're going to go out and sheep among wolves. And I don't know about you, but I know what sheep, sheep among wolves end up as lamb chops. So it, it looks pretty dire for those poor disciples. So while we're in Nehemiah, let's, let's look at one, little, one more story. Nehemiah 6, verses 10 through 14. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer, and he said, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come and kill you. Again, you won't know what hit you. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, and, but that he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and some ballot had hired him. For this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act the way, that way in sin, so that they might ha have cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. And then he turns to, oh my God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat. He turns to prayer again. According to these, their works, and the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Some of you sitting here are afraid. I know so because we all face the same uncertain future. I know I've talked to countless people. What about the time of trouble? What about this? What, what's coming? In? And all I hear when people ask me that question is the fear in their voice. Oh, 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 oh. 
What about the threats? Oh, we'll be, we'll be in trouble in the future. And it's always unnerving to think about these things because you know what kind of world we live in where people just pull out guns and shoot people. You know, you know what it's like. But you know, I'm not so sure that this world is much different today. Is it? Nehemiah. They were trying to frighten him, and what did he say? I am not going in hiding. By the way, when they ask you, because the time of trouble is coming, well, I used to live in, in, in time of trouble heaven. Alaska's where everybody runs, because the, the, the federal government is so far away, they can never find you in Alaska. I know, I used to live there, and I say, Come on, are you kidding? The military's all around us. All they had to do is send, you know they have radios now? They can communicate. They can still send guys out for you. Are you kidding? Again, you're not going to get through because you're going to outsmart the devil in the end. You're going to get through because God is with you in the very end. You're not going to get through because you're smarter than the average bear. You're going to get through because the bear is on your side. Then he's going to come. So I have one more story, then I'll sit down. But this story is from my other homeland, New Guinea. By the way, this is a legendary story. I never met this guy, but he's legendary. He's still being talked about. But this story comes from before I was a pilot in New Guinea. His name is Feoli. And he was born into a cannibalistic tribe. And one day, as part of his initiation rites, he was sent out, along with eight other men, young men. Nine young men went out and had to kill someone to prove that they were now men. Faoli did his job. He went and killed a person and brought back proof to his chief. But the beast had been awakened. And he began to kill again and again. He loved killing. He started murdering women and children, even his own tribesmen, and everyone was afraid of him. He was a terror to everyone. He would just kill because he loved killing. He just, he just enjoyed it. So when the police came from Port Moresby looking for the man who killed for the sake of killing, his own tribesmen turned him over to the police in fear and relief. And he went to jail. Years went by. Feoli was in jail, then he was out. He was in jail, and he was back out. But as he was in jail, of course you know, in jail they give him training. They try to give him a, a skill. And so he was trained. He, he, he became a carpenter in, in the jail. And, and so he began to be a skilled carpenter. And one day, he's out of jail, and he goes to the mission, the Adventist mission, and he says, I'm a carpenter, and, and I want to work for you. And the foreman who recognized him, you see, the missionary didn't, the foreman just had one word. He said to the missionary, Paoli. And that was all it took. And the missionary said, are you kidding? Is that who it is? He said, yeah, he's Paoli. Do you think he got hired? No. So he didn't get that job. Time goes by again. One day, the same missionary is in a new mission in the interior of New Guinea. He's building a new station in the interior. And who shows up? In fact, 20 years have gone by, and the guy knocks on the door, and the missionary says, they don't know how to knock out here. See, Feoli was from the coast. He opens the door, and he says, I come to school. I, I, I want to come to school. And he says, no, 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 no. It's for children. And he doesn't recognize him. And then he says, if they only learn, read. If they only learn, A, B, C. And then he says, Feoli? Did you say Feoli? And both he and his wife are afraid. But after all, 
they decide to give him a chance. So they give him a second chance, and learning his ABCs and learning about Jesus were just part of the same package for Faoli. And more time passes, and Faoli's different. And now a new station is opened, and the missionary says, I need a helper. Will you send me, guess who? Faoli. Well, after spending some more time in helping this missionary as a teacher and a helper, they decide to send him for his own village. He's now going to be the teacher and the leader in another village. And he is now changed. His voice is loved and respected. But the ways that Faoli taught were not the old ways, the ways of the old gods. And the people feared change. So over the mountain, in another village, the chief dies, suddenly. He's fine one day, and the next day he's dead. Well, they have no technology to say, oh, it was a heart attack or whatever. They call the medicine man. What is the matter? He is alive one day. The next day he's dead. Tell us, medicine man, what is the matter? And the medicine man says, the spirits have spoken. The trouble lies over the mountain. It's Faoli. He has brought the trouble. He has taken us away from our gods. And so the drums begin to beat. They call a council. The war, the war council, they're beating the drums. And the wires are preparing for battle all night. But you know, the drums talk over the mountain. And the people over the mountain hear the drums. They know what's up. They hear, they hear what's coming. And they all run. They drive their pigs and their animals out into the jungle. And they come, the last one comes to Faoli and says, come on, get out of here. They're singing the death chant. You must leave, we are all leaving, you must flee. But like Nehemiah, he says, I'm not running. I'm not going anywhere. I do not fear. I have read my Bible. I have prayed. I am staying right here. And by the way, he didn't just stay by himself. He stayed with his family in the village. So it was that Faoli rested in the Lord. The warriors came. They found the village deserted, or at least they thought it was deserted. And they were about to burn the village anyway, after all, uh, when a runner comes, Faoli is here. Oh, and they start talking. Oh, he's here after all. We can catch the evil one after all. Let's go. And they, and they creep toward the, the hut of Faoli. But he is guarded, they say. There, around the hut, see? A row of white men all around the hut. Animals? Angels, too. <laughs> See? God uses angels. But those warriors, they don't know. They don't know what this is. All they see is white men. They say to themselves, no white men live around here. Who are they? Are they men? <gasps> or are they spirits? Spirits, and they run for their lives. The next morning, a lone man is sent back to the village to see what had happened. To his surprise, there is Faoli sitting in front of his hut. He runs up. You did not hear their drums? You did not hear their cries? You did not hear all of that? No, Faoli said. The night passed peacefully. Before we slept, we prayed. And I read my Bible. I read the same lines over and over again. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. And the angels showed up. Now, I can't guarantee that every time you need help, angels will actually show up. You know, it doesn't work that way all the time. It's okay. 
But I can guarantee you that those angels are really there, whether you see them or not. So don't be afraid. Or as John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Love divine, all loves excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion. Pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Let us stand together to sing our closing hymn. Father in heaven, we come to you today, and we know there is so much in this world to be afraid of, but Lord, your love entering into our hearts will cast out all that fear. And so we come to the words of Jesus. We ask that you implant that love in our hearts, that you bring us to where we cannot fear, that you give us the courage that only your, your presence can give us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.